you are old, Father William, the young man said, and your hair has become very white, and yet you incessantly stand on your head. Do you think at your age it is right? In my youth, Father William replied to his son, I feared it might injure the brain, but now that I'm perfectly sure I have none, why, I do it again and again. <laughs> You are old, said the youth, as I mentioned before, and have grown most uncommonly fat, yet you turned a back somersault in at the door. Pray, what is the reason of that? In my youth, Father William replied to his son, I feared it might injure the brain, but now that I'm perfectly sure I have none, why, I do it again and again. You are old, said the youth. One would hardly believe that you're Jaws were as steady as ever, but you finished the goose with the bones and the beak. Pray, how did you manage to do it? In my youth, Father William said, I took to the law and argued each case with my wife, and the muscular strength which it lent to my jaw has lasted the rest of my life. <laughs> you are old, said the youth, and would heart, one would hardly suppose that your eye was as steady as ever, yet you balanced an eel on the end of your nose. What made you so awfully clever? I have answered three questions and that is enough, said his father. Don't give yourself airs. Do you think I can listen all day to such stuff? Be off or I'll kick you downstairs. Our uh, opening uh, poem tonight, uh, giving some recognition to people of some age. And uh, of course, there were few instances in the 19th century of uh, the sparing the rod to spoil the child, none, none such nonsense back then. Of course, that was because the concept of childhood is only about six generations old, and we didn't treat children like children back before pretty much the end of the uh, 19th century. Uh, good evening. We are here on the UMD campus once again. Thank you for inviting me back my second year in a row. Uh, my name is Peter Thomas. I call myself the live bard and for the last uh, 14 or so orbits of the earth about the sun, I have been wandering around uh, doing poems that tell stories, not that other stuff that you see in the paper, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, this, that poem incidentally is from uh, Lewis Carroll. It's from Alice in Wonderland. It's the response that Alice gives to the uh, hookah-smoking caterpillar. Uh, because he says, recite Father William, and um, uh, this is a mischievous parody of, uh, of uh, a nice poem by Robert Southey, uh, which was written in uh, early 1800s. Uh, Southey was for 30 years the poet laureate of England. So I thought I would just give you two stanzas of what the real thing like so you was so you'd have an appreciation for it. You are old, Father William, the young man cried, and pleasures with youth pass away, and yet you lament not the days that are gone. Now tell me the reason, I pray. In the days of my youth, Father William replied, I remembered that youth could not last. I thought of the future, whatever I did, that I never might grieve for the past. Look forward, not backwards, uh, contends Southey, and I think that's sage advice. Um, but in the humorous vein that we've done, we're going to do something else from a, another contemporary of Lewis Carroll. Uh, a witty fellow named uh, William Gilbert. Uh, Gilbert was one half of the theatrical team of Gilbert and Sullivan. And in addition to his writing of plays, he for about 10 years wrote uh, ballads uh, and published them. Um, before I start, a couple of words from the poem, uh, Deal and Ramsgate are two side-by-side uh, -side towns on the imaginary map of England that I'm pointing to here on the southeast corner. Uh, white was a familiar term for a fellow or a guy. Big, a brig was a two-masted ship with square sails and a gig was a rowboat. That's all we need to know. It was on the shores that round our coast from Deal to Ramgate span that I found alone on a piece of stone an elderly naval man. 
His hair was weedy, his beard was long, and weedy and long was he. And I heard this white on the shore recite in a singular minor key, Oh, I am a cook and a captain bold, and the mate of the Nancy Brig, and a bosom tight, and a midship might, and the crew of the captain's gig. Then he shook his fists and he tore his hair till I really felt afraid, for I couldn't help thinking the man had been drinking, and so I simply said, Oh, elderly man, it's little I know of duties of men in the sea, and I'll eat my hand if I understand how you can possibly be at once a cook and a captain bold, and the mate of the Nancy Brig, and a bosom tight, and a midship might, and the crew of the captain's gig. And he gave a hitch to his trousers, which is a trick all seamen learn, and having got rid of a thumping quid, he spun this painful yarn. Twas in the good ship Nancy Bell that we sailed to the Indian Sea, and there on a reef we came to grief, which has often occurred to me. And pretty nigh all of the crew was drowned. There were 77 of soul, and only 10 of the Nancy's men answered here to the muster roll. There was me and the cook and the captain bold and the mate of the Nancy brig and a bosom tight and a midship might and the crew of the captain's gig. For a month, we'd neither victuals nor drink till the hungry we did feel. So we drawed a lot and accordingly shot the captain for our meal. The next lot fell to the Nancy's mate in a delicate dish we made, then our appetite with the midship might, we seven survivors stayed, and then we murdered the bosom tight, and he much resembled pig, and then we whittled free, did the cook and me on the crew of the captain's gig. Then only the cook and me was left, and the delicate question which of us goes to the kettle of rose, and we argued it out as sitch, for I loved that cook. As a brother I did in the kirk, he worth, worshipped me, but we both be blowed if we'd either be stowed in the other chap's hole, you see. I'll be eat if you dines off me, says Tom. Yes, that, says I, you'll be. I'm boiled if I die, my friend, quoth I, and exactly so, says he. Says he, dear James, to murder me were a foolish thing to do. For don't you see that you can't cook me? Well, I can and will cook you. <laughs> so he boils the water and takes the salt and pepper and portions true and some chopped shallot, which he never forgot, and sage and parsley too. Come here, he says, with a proper pride, which his smiling features tell. Twill soothing be if I let you see how exceedingly nice you'll smell. And he stirred it round and round and round, and he sniffed at the foaming froth. One eye ups with his heels and smothers his squeals and the scum of the boiling broth. And I eat that cook in a week or less, and as I eating be the last of his chops, why I almost drops. For a vessel in sight I see. And I never laugh, and I never smile, and I never lark or play. But I sit and croak with a single joke I have, which is to say, Oh, I am a cook and a captain bold and the mate of the Nancy Brig and a bosom tight and a midship might and the crew of the captain's gig. Sir William Schwenk Gilbert, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Again, that's the yarn of the Nancy Bell. Um, and that narrative verse, where you have a narrator talking in the poem and one or more speakers, and I like to do that, uh, and we're going to be doing a bunch of it for our, the rest of our hour in our show, which we're calling More Poems for People Who Hate Poetry. And I, the reason I choose that is because if you pick up a copy of the New Yorker magazine or other publications, they have a modern poet in there. And uh, I uh, thought I would get, I always pay some 
obeisance to you know those people that really get published in in, in publications. So I uh, of, of consequence, and I so I'm, I'm going to do one. And I um, actually I had some help interpreting uh, this one modern poem. I'm going to do this now and get it out of the way so I can get back to the fun stuff. But um, this uh, this uh, appeared in uh, the New York Review in uh, 2011, and I had to ask this young lady back here who's a Poet tests also to help me translate that, so we're gonna we'll we'll get through this. Three quick poems. Sharp light. The eye held thin against the air, sharpened on the light, cut along the sky. Blue pages, printed days, pressed into the outside roads. The silence is deaf. Burial. Second poem. That bright edge of sky lined a solid face, packed in bones, a buried earth drying flat on the sheets of stone. And lastly, I'll put you out of your misery soon. Weather, the sun rubbed thin across the eye, the shadows from the head straightened into rain, the sky clears behind empty rooms of blue. <laughs> That's why I don't do modern poetry. I, obviously, obviously, this is the metaphor, but we will be kind of talking to, to uh, about that. Let me do uh, let me do another uh, fun thing here. Um, although this one isn't for the faint of heart either. Uh, this poem was written in 1890, uh, based on true facts uh, of events that occurred in India. It uses the language of a common soldier, a remarkable innovation for the British reading public of the time. Uh, two terms, uh, files on parade is a unique way to use a plural noun to represent uh, each young soldier that this story uh, would have touched. Uh, and a color sergeant is the senior non-commissioned officer in an infantry company. Um, and, and one interesting factoid that I came on in, in researching this poem years ago was that a noted academic of the time, a Professor Mason, who was a expert on the 17th century epic poet in Paradise Lost by John Milton, exclaimed to his enthusiastic class after reading this poem, now here's literature. Here's literature at last. And it's, we'll see as we go on how uh, things changes. What are the bugles blowing for, said Files on parade. To turn you out, to turn you out, the color sergeant said. What makes you look so white, so white, said Files on parade. I'm dreading what I got to watch, the color sergeant said. For they're hanging Danny Deaver. You can hear the dead march play. The regiments in Allo Square, they're hanging him today. They've taken of his buttons off and throwing his stripes away, and they're hanging Danny Deaver in the morning. What makes the rear rank breeze so hard, said Files on parade. It's bitter cold, it's bitter cold, the color sergeant said. What makes that front rank man fall down, said Files on parade. A touch of sun, a touch of sun, the color sergeant said. They are hanging Danny Deaver. They are marching of him round. They have halted Danny Deaver by his coffin on the ground, and he'll swing in half a minute for a sneaking shooting hound. Oh, they're hanging Danny Deaver in the morning. His cot was right and cot to mine, said Files on parade. He's sleeping out and far tonight, the color sergeant said. I've drunk his beer a score of times, said Files on parade. He's drinking bitter beer alone, the color sergeant said. They are hanging Danny Deaver. You must mark him to his place, for he's shot a comrade sleeping. You must look him in the face. Nine hundred of his county and the regiment's disgrace. Well, we're hanging Danny Deaver in the morning. What's that so black again, the sun? said Files on parade. It's Danny fighting hard for life, the color sergeant said. What's that that whimpers overhead, said Files on parade. It's Danny's soul that's passing now, 
the color sergeant said, for we're done with Danny Deaver. You can hear the quick march, re the regiments in column and they're marching us away. <laughs> the young recruits are shaken and they'll want their beer today after hanging Danny Deaver in the morning. Danny Deaver, ladies and gentlemen. I, I, uh, I like to do some uh, occasional historical tidbit. Uh, capital punishment was outlawed in England in 1865 if it happened in the British Isles, but in the military for another 35 years, they were still able to execute uh, for capital crimes. And they executed 37 people before they decided to end that practice.